my brother enlisted in the Air Force. I called home and can you remember before we could enlist we had to get a release from the draft board? Yeah. And uh, so I called the draft board and said I wanted to enlist and they said okay. My mother said she'd rather I didn't, but I did. And then I had been working in Kitson County and I took an exam for West Point. So anyway, uh, six, eight months later, I was in Santa Ana and my appointment to West Point came through. I was so afraid that I wasn't going to be able to fly that I turned it down. And I found out later, every single graduate of that class that I would have been in became a general, and they all flew. <laughs> <laughs> so I made some bad decisions. Uh, and I also had some close calls. You know, it, you didn't necessarily have your close calls in, in combat. Uh, while I was in Ardmore, Oklahoma, and we had a bunch of war-weary planes from Africa, and they're all full of sand, and the engines were shot. So they, the first, my first night solo flight, and uh, I went out and spun this supercharger that was full of metal. So we went back and got another plane. And so we went to the end of the runway and started taking off and my number two engine, the number one piston blew out through the feathering mechanism and started on fire. <laughs> so I ran the other three throttles to the limits and to the wires and, and the number three engine, uh, number one piston blew out through the feathering mechanism and it started on fire. And it was a real dark night and I called the uh, tower and said, uh, I want to get land really quick. <laughs> All they could see was a ball of flyer. And so uh, I said, I don't think I'll be able to make it around the pad. And they said, once you land down, downwind on the, on the runway you just took off on. Well, I didn't listen very good. My co-pilot told me I was coming in too hot. And on three engines, I wanted to hold my power on. 500 feet to put my brakes on, I found out that wasn't a good idea. In the air, that was, not on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I landed, my brakes were frozen. And they never let me forget, because I made two nice black marks down the runway the whole way to the end, and then nosed it up in front of the fire trucks. And remember that movie about uh, real life uh, where pilot was flying a commercial jet and, or, and he came in with the plane on fire. Well, I tell you, I, I didn't know I had that many fire trucks, but I had a whole row of fire trucks coming out to meet me. But I, so I nosed it up right in front of the truck and they put the fire out. Uh, my uh, engineer, he quit flying that day. <laughs> He said, never again, you're going to get me in an airplane, so they probably sent me all of a sudden, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you're going to the Russian front, so I don't know if you went to the Russian front or not, but anyway, uh, then uh, we got ready to take off for uh, England and uh, uh, from Ardmore and uh, no, it wasn't, it was in Nebraska, Kearney, Nebraska, and uh, all the family of the crew came and we had a picnic. And my uh, bombardier's mother, he was 19 years old. I guess I was too. She came and put my arms around me and said, now you take good care of my boy. So night after night after night, they scheduled us to take off and then they canceled it. And uh, finally, they came, we took off. My co pilot went down below the cockpit to went to lay and sleep because he'd been partying every night for 10 days. His last big party before we went overseas. So I got up to the altitude we were supposed to fly, and Denver had beautiful music, so I turned on Denver and put on autopilot and, and uh, went to sleep. <laughs> and when we came to a turn in the, in the, the Nightline, I didn't turn. 
So the bombardier warmed up the bomb site, turned it back on course, and came up. I never will forget, as he shook me. Ooh, what my mother would have said. <laughs> so, uh, but that was after uh, we, I went to uh, primary training in uh, in a uh, Ryan, and I loved that plane. That was uh, a really great. We uh, packed the short reel uh, landings. And we had a volleyball net across the end of the runway, and we dropped it in right over there. And uh, I was real proud of the fact that I could turn off in the first taxiway, which was about 40 feet down the runway. <laughs> and uh, then I went to basic and through the vault vibrator. And I imagine quite a few of you guys did that. And uh, we'd heard that it spun a lot. And so when we got off the buses at uh, the base, uh, the guide said, uh, now you probably heard that the, this vaulty vibrator spins a lot, but don't kid yourself, that ain't true. And one just spun in behind them. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went, I went to uh, primary for basic uh, advanced training, and my instructor pilot said that we flew, I, think, I don't know, C-45s, and uh, twin engine craft, and my instructor pilot said, no, you're all going to heavies. If you say you want to go to heavies, you'll fly in the left seat. If you say you want fighters, you'll fly in the right seat. <laughs> you're all going to heavies. So I had an unhappy co-pilot, because he wanted, he wanted uh, to fly fighters. But he was a pretty sharp pilot. He could land that 17 a lot better than I could. And, uh, after we got out of, out of service, he went off and became a commanding general of a uh, fighter group in California. But uh, the uh, B-17 really took a beating at, uh, uh, on one of my missions. We uh, went down, we, I wasn't flying, I was flying as assistant lead our second lead, and the lead pilot missed the target. So over the middle of Germany, we went down the Ruhr River Valley looking for targets of opportunity. Well, we were a good target. They shot out my third and fourth engines. My second engine was running away, and I pulled all the power I could on number one, and I burned it up, but we got home. I had 169 holes in the plane, 24 gas tanks, had hole 19 of them, that B-17 just wouldn't quit flying. And one of the things that we used to do when, when, when people were on a mission, I got so scared, I was too scared, I was, but uh, when a mission was scheduled for the next day, I lay in bed wide awake, just shaking with fear, and when uh, they called a mission and I wasn't on it, I went to sleep until about three in the morning, two or three in the morning when they called a mission. And when, when I wasn't on the mission, I went to sleep and slept till noon. And uh, we uh, did some interesting things. We dropped supplies to Warsaw. And we planned it so long, one third of our B-17s had 251 drop tanks. And the rest of us had supplies for Warsaw. The horrors in London asked us when the hell we're going. And every, no slip and lip, everybody in London knew it. And, and so uh, we finally took off and we got the supplies to Warsaw. And I was real proud of that. Found out we missed the target so that uh, all the supplies landed behind the German lines, and Warsaw surrendered that day. <laughs> Nothing to brag about. And then we, uh, to get into Warsaw, we, it took more fuel than we could take to go home again. So we went on and landed in, in Russia. And when we landed in Russia, the commanding officer, we, we got upset with our commanding officer, because the, 
Russian generals came out and said, how many women do you need tonight? And our commanding officer said, none. And that didn't sit too well. <laughs> <laughs> so then we put on more supplies. <laughs> and we got supplies to Tito. And you, when we went across the mountaintop, we just skinned the mountaintop. And you could see them out. They had white robes. But you could see them all picking up the, the bundles of food and supplies. <clears throat> and then we went down, guess what? We landed at Kosovo. And uh, I guess we've all heard of that more than once. So Kosovo was an English base at the time. We put on English bombs and bombed Munich on the way home. That was a real wrong <laughs> One thing about bombing Munich, it was so close to Switzerland that the Swiss sent their air force up to watch us so we didn't stray into Switzerland. And we had orders that if we got shot up to drop our wheels and surrender to the Swiss. But they said there were so many Germans in Switzerland that were hit little bombs. What the side of your fist? The spike on. And we're supposed to, as soon as we landed in Switzerland, we're supposed to go out and pound this pipe in each wing and the plane would burn up so that the Germans couldn't get our bomb set. And uh, on one of our missions, my bombardier, that 18 year old, or he was 19 years old, on his 20th birthday, we were making a, we had 38 250 pound hand grenades. They're about this big, but they're cut like a hand grenade. Anti-personnel bomb. So the German, as we were taken off of the 100th bomb group in England, the Germans started strafing us. And I called my bomb there and said, get your butt up here on the guns. I know you can't hit anything, but you scare them away. <laughs> But we had two tracers out of every five. We had two tracers in the front and two tracers in the back, and the fifth one was a bullet. But any, anyway, we, we must have scared them off. So uh, when he, we didn't know until we went down the bomb run. This was a frontline mission, and we didn't know that uh, when he left the bomb bay, he hit a switch. So we get in, bombs away, our bombs didn't go off. And I called my commanding officer and said, I'm going in again. He said, no, you don't. There's too much fighter escort. I said, what do you mean, fighter escort? He said, there's a hundred Germans out there. So I had to go home with them. And then, then he said, you can drop your bomb and go to channel. But we were socked in. And I couldn't see the channel. So I had to land with 38 of those 250-pound hand grenades in the bomb bay. And I was afraid the struts would break when I, when I hit because I, I had a tendency to land a little hard. <laughs> <laughs> my hope I could grease it in, but I, I couldn't. My depth perception, I must have had about as low a grade as you could get from depth perception. Uh, and still, they needed pilots so badly when I went. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then, then uh, one day we, we bombed Munich, and I knew... You could see the sun through the ice crystal, but you couldn't see beyond your wingtips. So we climbed over England to 20,000 feet. And when we broke out, I knew before we left England that I wasn't going to get home. But, young ho, we went in and bombed. And I call, called my commanding officer, and remember we all had all in the airfields to land at? So I called my commanding officer and said, look, you know, i got to land at the Orange Airport. I'm not running out of gas. And he said, you can't. The Germans took it over today. You've got to try for one close to the Paris. And I gave him a name, and I said, I'll never make it. But I thought I had a good relationship with the crew, but we threw out all the guns, all the ammunition. And then when I told them to bail out, they wouldn't do it. <laughs> so we went in, and we, I had the engineer standing behind me. And all 24 gas tanks showed empty. I said, keep a little in the outboard if you have to, because 
I can steer better with the outboards. Then a twin-engine plane approached the runway ahead of me. And boy, I'll tell you, there was one guy that was going to get his butt chewed on royally. I don't know, I swear I felt better when I found that he started dropping bombs. He was German. <laughs> so we went in and dodging bombs. And when my tail dropped, the two inboard engines quit. And an Army engineer came up to us and said, uh, I've got four wives that I can truck you out to the German lines. I think we can get through the lines if you get on a truck right away. And they said, no, all we need is gas. He said, well, Patton is coming up from Paris with gas, so we waited for Patton. We waited three days. And I figured he'd drive up the back of the plane with the gas truck, right? No, all Patton had was six gallon jerry cans. <laughs> <laughs> he just threw them off at the... At the back of the wing, and so it takes a long time to gas your airplane at six gallons at a time. <laughs> we had one guy on the edge of the wing, another guy up above holding on his ankles, and the third guy was handing it up, and we gassed it up six gallons at a time. And uh, interesting how the French approached the war. While we were waiting for Patton to get up there with the gas, we wandered around the countryside looking for something to eat. And uh, we heard it sounded like a motor. We went into this great big building and there was a thrashing machine powered by electric motor. And they were thrashing grain right in the middle of the boat. And the Lord of the Manor, he came while we were there. He had uh, riding bridges with the chamois on the inside of his lake, you know, and, and uh, Pops out the side of his pants, I don't know what they call him. And uh, the old tri old hat, he had leather gloves on. He took his gloves off and ran through the wheat, dusted his hands off, and tipped his hat, and away he went. Uh, then we were still looking for food, and we found, by gosh, you know, those engineers that said nuts. We, I think, ran into their chow. Oh, we're hungry. We're going to get some food. And we noticed that there's a couple of French whores in Chow Line. They were getting their food. You could tell them because when the Germans left, the French shaved the heads of all the women that had associated with the Germans. So we get up there in line. They said, nope, they didn't have any food to spare for us. So we didn't get any. But the French whores did. <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a matter of priority. <laughs> but uh, then we'd heard that bourbon sold for a hundred dollars a quart. Well, in Carney, it sold for forty-five dollars a case. So, boy, were we going to get rich? We went down and bought ten cases of bourbon, and uh, when we landed in Ireland, and then we had to go across, you know, all the trains ran north and south. So we had, I think, six transfers probably from little short roads across. I tell you, with a duffel bag in one hand, a case of whiskey in the other, it was hard walking. <laughs> but yeah, we almost had to give up the, the V4s, but uh, not the food. So, uh, Went on my first mission, and uh, my uh, we got caught out of, out of Europe, but uh, they had a recall because the fighters couldn't get off, but we didn't hear it. So we ended up on a beautiful, clear, sunshiny day over the middle of Germany, 39 of us. And the Germans hit us, and four minutes knocked down 26 of us. So that must be part of the 150 planes. But anyway, uh, Germans came from behind, and I was flying full pilot to, to get some combat experience. And so I was hunched behind that metal plate. And uh, the pilot, he was really reassuring. He said, they're using 20 millimeters. I'll go right through that sling by water. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, then he sat and looked. Look at him come. Look at him come. Look at him come. The first German I saw blew up right off our wing tip. We got him. And, uh, the, uh, 
Then I was lucky, you know, I had luck of the draw. I was scheduled to go to Hamburg, and I took off. I couldn't get turbo on the third number three engine, so I couldn't keep up. Went back and landed, and the hundreds bomb group practically got wiped out over Hamburg. I think some of the people here were there that saw a buddy of mine, a hole filled, uh, somebody was knocked down, and my buddy and uh, another plane tried to fill the spot at the same time, and they stuck together, and they went into the North Sea with all eight engines running, but they couldn't get the top plane out of, off of the bottom one. And uh, they didn't think, I. they thought I was a coward, that I uh, aborted because nothing was wrong on my airplane. So they all, all four inches were running when I landed. And it took them three days to find out the clue, and I'm glad I didn't. I wouldn't be here now, probably. If I chopped the throttle way back and advanced it, I'd have turbo. But I didn't. When you're already falling behind, who the hell's going to cut your car off? <coughs> so I didn't, and so I went in and landed. But it took them three days to find out that simple little thing, and they fixed it. But uh, when we went over there, we were thinking about, we had a meeting with a uh, young flying uh, women, were they wax? Yeah. But anyway, we had a meeting with, with this uh, woman. She said, how many of you expect to survive the war? And there was nine of us, and we held up nine hands. And she said, well, I got news for you. Only one, on law average is only one will survive. The other eight will die. And, uh, but after my first mission, when I flew co pilot, there, there was a bombardier from oh, a radio man of Dayball. So they had a, a pool of spare uh, airmen, and so they said, well, let, let's use Warren's. Uh, radio man because uh, he won't, see our crew only had to fly with the pilot. And so my missions were through, the rest of the crew that only flew half as many missions because they'd been sick or something, they went home too. We all went home as a group. So anyway, they said, let's, let's use Orange radio man. And he got shot down. He's one of the, in the planes that got shot down. But the German Red Cross notified us, I think the same day, that he was in a hospital in Germany. And then they notified us three days later that that uh, he died <coughs> there. And his wife wouldn't believe it because we had our party back in Carney, Nebraska, ten days before that. And she said, oh, he, he, he can't be dead. He just wouldn't believe it. We had to get the chaplain to talk to her and tell her that it was true. But, uh, I think that one of the worst missions we went on, remember that town that the Germans bombed and we knew they were going to bomb it with, and we didn't want to let them know that we'd broken down the Enigma machine and it was Coventry, Coventry. or something? Coventry. 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 We knew they were going to bomb Coventry, but we let them go and do it. Then we flew a mission. We bombed Leipzig, and we destroyed Leipzig. And that was our get even for the for the uh, <coughs> what they did to Coventry. And uh, I lost the waste gunner there. He didn't get shot. He got scared and bailed out <laughs> because our number three engine was hit and was on fire. At the same time, I told, remember the red feathering button? And I told my co pilot to feather three. And he leaned forward and uh, he hit the feather button and it, the fire went off. And uh, we hit our commanding general, 
had a uh, set of bulletproof glass reserved for him. If I had a good ground crew, they went and stole it and put it in my plate. Hell, I had a good ground crew. And uh, the uh, bulletproof glass from my coat pilot side just disappeared as he was leaning forward to feather number three. And when we got down, we found a big hole underneath my seat. We figured a, an 88 shell broke in half and went, went through. And my co-pilot was pretty good with it. He ducked it <laughs> and, and blew out the window. But uh, that old B-17 had really, really uh, took a lot of like I say, 169 holes at one time. Holes in 19 gas tanks. But you know, it looked like a rubber tire. Uh, they're puncture proof. And so the piece of plaque would enter, they'd seal. <coughs> and every mission when we landed, the tin smith came out first. They cut the little holes into little bigger holes and then screwed a piece of aluminum on it. So you could tell how many hit you that by going counting all the patches and nuts <laughs> for the wing. But uh, the the time I came, oh, you know, we always talk about the white cliffs is over. And I'd been on a mission and I was all shot up. And I'll tell you, I had a hell of a time pulling it up high enough so we didn't plow into the white cliffs and over. We just skinned it. And then we landed at home. And it took both wings off and uh, uh, replaced all four engines. And they told me that a spar in one of the wings was damaged. They said if they'd known before they started that it was as badly damaged as it was, they would have taken the axe to it. But I'm glad they didn't. The last time I saw my plane it was in Tucson, Arizona, on that old plane wrecking point, you know, it was parked out there. But, you know, we fought the Kiwi War, there was honor amongst fighters and the bombers. If you got shot up and couldn't go home, you dropped your wheels and the German fighters would escort you to Luftwaffe. A loop, what do they call it? Uh, airport, anyway, for the German fighters. And they'd wine you and dine you, and then take it to the Stalin. But we had one guy, he escaped from Stalag twice. I didn't think they did right. So once you got back, you should have been sent home. But they, they just put you back in the list of fly. So, okay. Yep. But there is one thing about our war. We knew we were heroes. <laughs> Thank you a lot. Very nice. I'm sure he's got a lot more to go. <laughs> but uh, it's getting late. Uh, anybody else have anything they want to bring up at this time, or uh, anything they want to say? Well, I think that's about it. We'll uh, break it off. We'll see you.